All right. Hey, everyone. Come on in. Grab a seat. It's good to see you. We are going to get started with our evening service. I was just about to call Michael out by name, but he's He's going to move back to the back and get quiet already. All right, so welcome here. Um, just really quickly, good to see you all. Um, so glad that you made it out. So glad that you are staying safe and healthy during all of this. <laughs> I'm looking at you, Sheree. Um, so yeah, so welcome here. Let me just go through some announcements before we get into the sermon. Um, first of all, if you are one of those people who feel like you might be missing some emails, if you don't think that you're getting all of the correspondence that you should be, um, just call Tammy or, or email Tammy this week and she'll get you set up with that. She'll, she's a whiz at our software by this point, so she'll get you um, all figured out there. If you would like to be giving during this time that we're um, that we're not always meeting here you can still give um, while you're here and the box is just out on the bar in the lobby but you can also give online or on the app is actually um, one of the easiest and best ways as far as fees and stuff like that go so if you haven't downloaded the app yet or if you don't use that for giving yet um, I would highly recommend using the app for that um, just really quickly as we're talking about phones if you could just take a minute right now and go ahead and silence your phones we are recording this service and this is the one that gets sent out in the morning for everyone who doesn't get to be here um, so any any disturbance would be um, we'll just go ahead and silence our, our cell phones right now so um, that's all I have for announcements we're actually gonna uh, I'll ask you to stand with me right now so that we can read our verse for tonight this is from Psalm 119 your testimonies are wonderful, therefore my soul keeps them. The unfolding of your word give light. It imparts wisdom to the simple. I open my mouth and pant because I long for your commandments. Turn to me and be gracious to me, as is your way with those who love your name. Keep steady my steps according to your promise and let no iniquity get dominion over me. Redeem me from man's oppression that I may keep your precepts. Make your face shine upon your servant and teach me your statutes. My eyes shed streams of tears because people do not keep your law. Thank you, please stay standing for prayer. Father, it is with uh, joy that we get to open your word prospect of encountering you that we come to the printed page. Thankful to have it. Thankful to be able to think about it, to dwell on it, to turn it over. Lord, as we present ourselves to you, we do so at an odd hour, a season of our country, a season of our culture, many ways the life of our church and so it is in that context that we proclaim to you that we are always in need of you but we're more acutely aware of it right now perhaps so lord uh, bind up our fragilities our fears uh, speak to our timidity uh, quiet some of our uh, vociferous give us good ears to hear give us uh, hearts to ponder give us the capacity for humility in a season and day and age of arrogance and ego pray that you would help us to uh, be attentive to the wounds of each other be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ. For uh, those who are of ill health, we pray for them. For Sister Agnes, we always want to plead right now and uh, continually for your grace over her as she battles cancer. Uh, she's not alone in our church in battling health issues. There are others. Uh, our sister Marty Creed constantly battles pain, as does our sister Debbie Armstrong are many others, Lord, and each one needs you right now. Pray for your grace to come around them, to strengthen them, whether they're uh, our brother Bryce Thomas in an injured back, 
um, whether they're emotional challenges that many are facing, uh, marital challenges that are s straining people, familial dynamics crept up upon people. Some have lingered long and hard to pray for grace. For uh, job unsettledness, for transitions for some in our body, pray for your grace for them. Lord, we ask that you would see us through in our building project. Pray for grace, strength, discernment, wisdom. We just pray that you would give us favor in all fronts. Thank you, Lord, that in the oddities of the hour, we can still gather face to face. And for those who will be uh, worshiping at home on Sunday, we pray for them, that you would take your word and give it the wings that it needs pray for our time together. We beseech you, press beyond any spoken words, the hearts of people. We're feeble and we're frail and we need you, in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. You may take your Bibles, if you would, and turn to Luke chapter 8. Luke chapter 8. Last week we spent, I felt like, a very important time talking about gratitude, the nature of gratitude, the importance of gratitude, um, our limited capacity to comprehend, inculcate, and understand our own sinfulness. This evening we'll burrow down on a theme that was mentioned uh, a few messages ago, but the text goes deeper on a particular theme. And it's very clear if you read verses 1 through 21 that there is a central idea that wraps them all together. And it uh, really is, I guess, in, in one sense, it's, it's probably best portrayed just by the last statement in verse 21, if you let your eyes go there. And we'll get there towards the end, but where Jesus says, my mother and my brothers are those who hear the word of God and do it. And so we're going to talk about this theme of responding to the word and hopefully... As we do, we're going to cover some somewhat familiar territory textually. I hope to give you some new insights. But the familiar territory is as much as like maybe the most famous miracle of Jesus outside of the resurrection might be like the feeding of the 5,000 because it shows up in all the Gospels. Um, there may be no parable that's more familiar than the parable often called but faultily called the parable of the sower. It's, it's better called the parable of the soils if we want to know what it's talking about. So we'll talk about that a little bit. That shows up in, not John, but it shows up in the synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. It's one of only three parables that shows up in all three. So we'll uh, get there. For now, I need to mention Vicki Anderson. There. See, isn't that great? You'd say somebody's name that's here, and now it's like, oh my word, what did I do? So Vicki helped us in our front yard uh, back uh, a, a while ago with a tree problem because Vicki's a master gardener. She knows all about this stuff. Jennifer and I are wonderful, stimulating people, but we know nothing about plants. So we lean on Vicki when something comes up. Okay, so we had this plant out front of the tree, and it was, a, it was an okay looking tree, and it was in a strategic spot. But I was out one day and I started looking in the tree like trees are supposed to look like this and it started looking like the leaning tower of Pisa and I was pretty sure trees don't from the root systems they're not supposed to go like that so I walk over to the tree and I and I lay hold of it and all of a sudden the tree literally is moving like this and I'm watching the ground move underneath it and I thought what in the world this is not what trees are supposed to do and I realized this thing was pretty unstable well not only was it pretty unstable but as I pulled on it, I literally pulled it right to the ground. And it was a sizable tree. Now, I mean, I, you know, I've got these huge guns, so maybe it's not that surprising for a mortal man. But I pulled it down, and the thing just, I mean, roots and all just popped up. Oh, my goodness. Felt around, and it was so moist, like I'd step on it, and it would start sinking in. So when you have horticultural... Uh, emergencies. You don't dial 911. You dial Vicki Anderson if you live in Daybreak. So, Vicki Anderson. So, she comes over. She's looking at it with us. And 
we realized I had a leak in a sprinkler system down there, and it ended up flooding the root system and killing the plant. Now, here's the interesting thing about this. I've had this happen twice, not, not twice with a tree, not that bad. But I, I had it happen with the tree, and then when I first moved into Utah, and I first was like, I, I brought my sensibilities from New York about watering soil here, and I'm watering, and I'm thinking, I live in a desert. I got to give water, 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 water. And all of a sudden, I'm flooding in the, in, the, in, the, in the grass is dying. And I'm like, this doesn't make sense. Like when I'm thirsty, I drink. So therefore my grass looks like it's thirsty and dying. It needs drink. And so I'm putting water on it and it's, it's, it's not helping. And what was happening is the more I put on, I was just flooding it. I was flooding it. I wasn't allowing the root system to go down and seek anything. It was just a disaster. Trees need water. Plants need water. They need other things too, but they, 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 they need, they need water. And yet there's this paradox that if you give it too much water, such that its system is unable to bring in the water, all of a sudden that which is intended to bring it life ends up destroying it, right? ends up causing it to come toppling over. I, my sweet congregation and friends, have pastorally watched over years of people who love the Word of God as a habit of, of, of objective study, but for some reason can flood their lives with word upon word upon word upon word upon word but have not developed the mechanisms to take in the Word of God and that which is intended as the very nutrition of life to the soul has become for them a tool of judgment. A tool of judgment. I don't want that for our church. We get a lot of word here, and that's by design. We're always going to get a lot of word here. But we have to have the capacity to think broad, deep, intentfully and intensively about the nature of what it means for the Word to come in. Sit with it. Dwell in it. Turn it over. Seek to find not how it applies to that person when I hear the message and go, man, I'm going to tell you what, that would be a good message for him to hear. I wish she was here and didn't miss church today. Just for you. Just for me. Just for us. Right? So we're going to learn about that as we get into to this text. There's a danger that a church built on the Word might not hear the Word very well. I, I, I've seen lots of churches over time that Man, they, they will talk about the Bible. They'll proclaim the book. They'll be a church of the book. They'll make you think all about how they're a church of the book. And they're just struggling to apply much of it at all. And we don't want to do that. We don't. So let, let's think a little bit. We're going to look at some observations about the Word, about how to respond to it. And I, as we work through what amounts to kind of, uh, kind of like four different little vignettes, if you will. One's prolonged, which is the famous parable we'll talk about. But let's just start in verse 1, and we'll read verses uh, 1 through 3, and, and we'll talk about a couple of things that come out of there, and we're just going to find some lessons along the way. So I'll invite you again, uh, Luke chapter 8, and, and just look at your text. Soon afterward, he went on through cities and villages, proclaiming in bringing the good news of the kingdom of God. And you'll remember, kingdom of God here is a way of talking about the rule of God over your life. So Jesus' teaching is concerned not with a verbal statement. This is important for us, and you'll see why in a moment. It's not with sort of this verbal statement of, I got the gospel as a propositional message out and now I move on. You know, that I, I, did, I did say the truth. I did say the gospel. 
It's not that kind of a thing. He's interested in communicating in a way that they would bring their life in full subjection to all that that message means. That's really important. We'll get down in that in a little bit. And the twelve were with him, and also some women who had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities. Mary, called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had gone out. And Joanna, the wife of Cusa, Herod's household manager, and Susanna and many others who provided for them out of their means. Let, let's, let's buzz through the first couple of these lessons. First, there's no response to the word of God without the proclamation of the word say well duh right? duh I know bear with me on a duh Romans 10 14 through 15 familiar text how then will they call on him in whom they have not believed this is golden chain of evangelism and how are they to believe in him of whom they've not heard how are they to hear without someone preaching and how are they to preach unless they are sent as it is written how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. I want to give you a statement. I just want you to, if you take notes, it's, you might jot it down. It's just something I want you to think about. And that is that we can't expect people to live according to a word that has never been taught or proclaimed. We can't expect people to live according to a word that has never been taught or proclaimed. And yet, it's always fascinating to find Christian people stunned that the world is the world. It's always fascinating to find Christian people who look at their coworkers and just cannot believe the way they talk. They talk like people who, yeah, who don't know Jesus. What would you expect? Watch your mouth. You expect something from your brothers and sisters, but you need to be careful what you expect from people in the world. Um, there, there's something that this means by a way of implication. It means that cultural change will not happen without the teachings of Jesus. Cultural change will not happen without the teachings of Jesus, namely because the teachings of Jesus in terms of both, both gospel and the implications of the gospel, gospel and ethics that follow the gospel, um, are coming from the lips if we were to just sort of bring Jesus down to earth because that's what God did we could say it like this they're coming from the lips of the most intelligent human that's ever lived who spoke about the most important subjects that have ever done giving you the best information on those subjects so therefore just on the concept of learning information to apply in human life when I come to Jesus' teaching, I'm coming to the best information on the most important subjects by the smartest guy that's ever lived. Okay? So I, I come in, I gotta, I, sometimes I've got to read the text that way. I've got to see that when he talks about anger, he's given me the best. When he talks about greed, he's, he's given me the best. When he talks about possessions, he's given me the best. When he talks about getting along, he's given me the best. When he talks about worry and anxiety, he's given me the best. That I really have to sit and think about what he said because... It's multi-layered, it's onion-like, I peel it back, and there's all these layers that I have to think about and that I, I have to go down the road. Now, here's something, and, and again, I'm going to periodically, we want to make application of the present day, and um, I do spend a little time on, on the sanctified place called Twitter. And Twitter's really good at identifying problems. People all over Twitter identify problems. That's not too bad. I mean, there's some problems to identify if you haven't noticed. Here's what Twitter stinks at. Twitter, in the limit of characters, is awful at providing solutions to the problems it identifies. And yet, it's amazing to me how many people try to piggyback tweet upon tweet upon tweet upon tweet. I was reading the other day a chain of 40 tweets. Tweet, 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 tweet. I mean, it's, 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 a, it's a bird just going down with all the tweets. And they're tweeting, and they're trying to give a solution to a problem. You can't do that because you can't nuance it. But we're guilty of this as Christians. So here's how we do it. We sloganeer, and we tagline things. Um, I'll give you a real, I'm going to give you a real uh, honest example. And, you know, anytime I open my mouth these days, I feel like I'm going to get myself in trouble. <sighs> so 
fun times. Um, I saw Robert Jeffress, pastor of First Baptist Dallas, put a tweet out the other day. And when you read it, you go, oh, yeah, yeah. And I saw somebody respond to it, and I thought, wow, that was a great response to it. You're 100% right. I'm going to paraphrase it for you, but Jeffress' tweet sounds pretty orthodox in what he says. And it probably is. It's necessary, but not sufficient. And I want to explain this to you because this is part of what we're supposed to do in church. We're supposed to teach nuances. Right? That's what we're supposed to do. So the tweet says something like this. The only solution for racism is a change of the human heart. It'll take a change of the human heart to ever bring about any change in racism. Okay. Now, I don't think anybody's going to hear that and go, that's wrong. I don't, think you're, I don't think any of us are. Here's the problem. The problem is, maybe because of the limits of Twitter, it doesn't say enough. Let, let, me, let me parallel racism to another issue. I have almost never heard somebody say, the solution to abortion is the change in the human heart. That might be true. But I myself testify at Senate subcommittee hearings. I myself have stood outside with posters. I myself have gone to public bat. I myself have been vociferous to the point of making others around me uncomfortable about unborn lives. Okay. Because I've acted like it's more than just a statement about the human heart. I've recognized that when I use slogans like, Brian, it's just about the gospel. It's only about the human heart. It's only about Jesus. It's in the Word. These kinds of slogans are necessary, but not sufficient. Because it is true that the gospel is sufficient, but the gospel has an entire flood of implications that must be teased out and explained in nuances for us to understand what they mean in regard to abortion, in regard to race in regard to treating my brother and sister in Christ, in regard to how I'm hoping that this building's going to get finished. I mean, like, literally, it's the biggest to the lowest. I've got to get beyond it, but include it, because I'm not good at stopping at the tagline of the slope. Right? I have to say, but wait a minute. It is that, but that flushes itself out in so many ways. That I have to understand. That's why when it comes to teaching the kingdom of God, it is teaching about gospel. It's about the good news. But it's about the kind of life that the good news gives birth to that is as nuanced as you can possibly imagine in the complexity of life. That's why you can talk about the gospel all day and never get to the end of it. So if you stop and you think about the gospel and you stop it, you only talk about your individual personal forgiveness of sins, and that's where your conversation in regard to gospel stops, and it never moves past that. It never talks about anything more than that application. It is a kind of incipient, seminal, immature, puerile understanding of gospel, right? Because I, gospel is that, but I have to think about the implications of that transformation and what that means now horizontally for everything that I'm about and how it plays into that. Are you with me? Just nod your head if you're with me. I'm, I'm feeling self-conscious, okay? Just make me feel good, even if you don't, even if you don't like it. Just agree for now and then send me an ask you know later. Okay. Now, proclaiming, you got to proclaim if, if there's going to be any response. So that means that, like, you have to teach people what the gospel life is like. You can't, as a parent, just spend your time only preaching the gospel of forgiveness. you got to do that. You better do that. You should do that. That's baseline one as a parent, as a grandparent. You better. But you also better talk to them about how to live. You better talk to them about how that gospel comes into the horizontal relationship. You need to remind them that when they're ready to punch their sister, speaking from experience, when they're ready to punch their sister, you might want to talk to them about how that's a gospel issue. you got to get there with them. You, you might want to do the same thing with racism. You might want to do the same thing with abortion. You might want to do the same thing with immigration. You might want to do the same thing with people's attitudes towards authority and police. You might want to do it all the way down the line. 
Think through every single facet of it. Okay. Well, he lists these ladies after listing the disciples. And then he says at the end, Luke, who provided for them out of their means. This is second. There's no response to the word of God without supporting the proclamation of the word. It's just tucked away here. I, I'm not even sure I've ever noticed it before, to be honest with you. I knew, you know, you know, these ladies come around and taking care of Jesus, and I think uh, taking care of Jesus means like, okay, they're, uh, you know, they're, they're sort of setting up camp and they're, they're cooking for the disciples along the way because I just don't think that the disciples probably were very culinary inclined based upon the background. Oh, isn't this wonderful? These ladies are contributing. To this. No, no, what's happening is these ladies are connected in different ways. You see that with Cusa, uh, the, the wife of Cusa, Susanna, they're connected, and what's happening is they're funneling money so that the proclamation of the kingdom of God could go forward. We think it starts with people supporting ministry with Paul and Paul thanking the Philippians. It did. That happened. Partnership in the gospel from the first day until now started with Jesus. Jesus was able to proclaim because people gave their resources so that he could proclaim. That is why giving to this church is so crucial. That's why this building becomes a big deal. It's not about the edifice. It's not about love for the building. It's not about we're bowing down and worshiping a facility. It's about the fact that more people can gather in there than gather in here. That's good news. And we can open the floodgates and we can extend our reach and we can express more of the gospel and, more of, and teach more on a regular basis about, to more people about how it is that the life of the kingdom works but it takes people supporting it to make it happen. So, you see it even in Jesus' ministry. Now, verse 4. We'll have a little aside. When a great crowd, it's not really aside, it's a gateway, but what, what I've decided to do is I think Jesus is a better exegete than I am. And so I'm going to let Jesus' explanation of the parables be what I teach you rather than my explanation of the parable. Okay, Because Jesus is going to explain it for us. So here he says the parable. It says, When a great crowd was gathering and people from town after town came to him, he said in a parable, A sower went out to sow his seed. And as he sowed, some fell along the path and was trampled underfoot, and the birds of the air devoured it. Some, second seed, fell on the rock, second soil, and as it grew up, it withered away because it had no moisture. Some fell among thorns. The thorns grew up with it and choked it, and some fell into good soil, grew and yielded a hundredfold. As he said these things, he called out, and this is mirrored again in verse 21, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. That's Jesus' way of saying, listen up. It's Jesus' way of saying, move beyond the auditory Move into the application of this. So that those who have ears to hear, let them hear, is a way of saying, don't just hear it. <laughs> Do something about it. So here we go. Verse 9. And when his disciples asked him what this parable meant, he said, and, and you know, bless Jesus when Jesus gets asked a question, as you've seen, the answer is never simple. Like, <sighs> so they ask him, and he says, to you, it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of God. But for others, they're in parables, so that seeing they may not see, and hearing they may not understand. And then the disciples went, huh? What, what's he getting at? Why does he say why does he say that? The word of God can be a tool of judgment, not just a tool of life. This is why he says this. Because the word of God falls on deaf ears. The word of God may fall on more deaf ears than it falls on ears that are ready to hear. See, there's a this is what the parable is about. The parable is about soils. We're going to see that in detail. Soil 
in the metaphor of parable is a particular constitution of the inner life. It's, a, it's, it's, it's where is it that the life, as the word comes and lands on it, what is the position of the life? And how does that give birth to fruitfulness combining with the word, or how does it not? How is it that something within the life or an extant element that is allowed in the inner life that somehow fights against the fruitfulness of the Word. The, the seed itself is potent. My Bible sits here, and a, as, as the, the concepts and terms that sit on this printed, these series of printed pages, it sits as the Word of God. It's not, it's not the, it doesn't become the Word of God as I encounter it. Right? It sits as the Word. And yet, not its inspiration, but its influence is in some way related to the kind of soil that I'm going to have in my heart. Now, when Jesus begins with the disciples here about this statement, he's referring to this text in Isaiah 6. Remember Isaiah 6's big vision in Isaiah 6, the glory of God, cherubim, or seraphim, back and forth, back and forth, right? Seraphim. And they're stating, worthy, worthy, holy, holy is the Lord. The whole earth is filled with his glory. And then Isaiah says, I saw it, and it, like, it was like the train of his robe filled the temple. He sees this holy thing. It's this incredible existential experience. And as he experiences it, he realizes his sinfulness. And, and the angel comes, burns his lips. He says, who, who will go for us? Who is it that will proclaim the truth of God out of this vision of holiness that you've seen? And he raises his hand and he says, here am I, send me. The next verse is verse 9. Sometimes you should be careful what you volunteer for. And he said, go and say to this people, keep on hearing but do not understand. Keep on seeing but do not perceive. Make the heart of this people dull and their ears heavy, and blind their eyes, lest they see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their hearts, and turn and be healed. And the text goes on, talking about judgment. See, when, when he said, here am I, send me, he is like people who say, I want to share Christ. And they go out, and they find out that most people don't want Christ shared. And the reception out there is a lot more hostile than the opportunity in here was sold as. I want to do it. I want to do it. And they go out and he realizes, man, this is a hard knock life doing this ministry stuff. There's judgment waiting for people. They're not ready to receive it. Jesus quotes this because he wants to show that people have had their hearts hardened. Now, keep in mind, there's been a buildup of this. Going back to the Sermon on the Plain. Well, even before then, really. But we can just start there. There's been this, you know, the teachings of Jesus, the teachings of the Pharisees, which way are you going to follow? And what have you seen even since then? The Pharisees just don't get it. The Pharisees' hearts are not ready. They're not open. They're not available to be able. The soil that's in them is one of these soils, but it's not quite the fourth soil. So let's look at these soils together. Point four comes out of verses 11 through 14. Now the parable is this. The seed is the word of God. The ones along the path are those who have heard. Then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts. He's explaining what he said up in verse 5, that some fell along the path and was trampled underfoot and the birds of the air devoured it. Birds often were seen as kind of negative in certain Judaistic texts. Think of Alfred Hitchcock and the birds. Takes away the word from their hearts so that they may not believe and be saved. And the ones on the rock are those who, when they hear the word, receive it with joy. 
But these have no root. They believe for a while, and in time of testing fall away. And as for what fell among the thorns, they are those who hear, but as they go on their way, they are choked by the cares and riches and pleasures of life, and their fruit does not mature. There are obstacles in responding to the word of God, and we're going to get three obstacles in this text. So we get them through these first three uh, soils. Now let me tell you the wrong way to come at this text which is almost always the way people come at this text. They ask this question, Brian, there's the four soils. Now, how many of them are saved? How many of the four soils are Christians? Is it just the fourth soil? Is it the last two soils? And people in their minds start to I believe in the last two, then you must have this theology or this theology. And so we're asking the wrong question of the text. The text is not a text about... Uh, which soils cut the mustard to make it by the skin of their teeth into the kingdom? That's not the point of the text. The point of the text is this. Let me show you what a fruitful life in God's kingdom looks like. The parable of the soils is answering what a fruitful life in God's kingdom looks like. It's not a text about who makes it under the limbo bar of God's judgment. We can talk about that in other places. It's not what this text is about. So you, we're kind of asking sometimes the wrong question about the text. Instead, what we have to ask is, what do we learn? What do we learn about a fruitful life in God's kingdom? What do we learn about what we're supposed to be like when we look at this text? So let's just look at each of these obstacles. So here, the first one, sown along the path, if you go back to verse 11, I'm sorry, verse 12, the ones along the path are those who have heard. So that, that's auditory. They, they, they heard it. The information came in. But just like that, the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts so that they may not believe and be saved. Please notice, it doesn't say that they do not. It's that they heard the spiritual warfare of the evil one took place immediately upon hearing, and it wasn't even an option for them to believe. They did not have the opportunity for consideration because the categories that were in their worldview had already been. Okay. To quote 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 3 through 4, and even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of of God. You've seen it and I've seen it in the faces of people. You share, you teach, you implore, you beseech about the gospel, and they might as well be looking right through you. Checked out. Checked out. It's frustrating. Don't get mad at them. I mean it. Don't get mad at them. There's something more going on than just you and them right now. The devil. The devil is deep in the details of what's happening here. First obstacle, the devil keeps people from really considering the word at all. They're, they're, they're just unavailable to receive. They may not believe. It's not possible for them. It's not an option for them. Because the devil... Has, so, so one of the things you pray, right? God, before I share with this person, before we sit over this word, before I confront this issue, oh God, would you hold the devil at bay in this conversation such that they would have ears to hear that would not be plugged by the evil one where the message is not permitted to be drawn into their life. Deep spiritual warfare that's taking place every time you go and share 
the word of the gospel, the word of the implications of the gospel, the teachings of Christ with anyone. The devil comes, takes away the word from their hearts so that they may not believe and be saved. Verse, uh, verse 13, second soil. The ones on the rock... Hold on just for a second while well, I'm getting there. It's not that the it's not that the the rocks are like gravel that are like brought in to the to the soil with it. Instead, imagine it like this. It's like a thin layer of soil that underneath is a hard layer of like a like a limestone or a shale or a rock. It's that you could see it, you could stick your finger down in it, but then you're gonna hit rock. You're going to hit rock. All right. There, are we better? Great. Thank you, Brad. You're going to hit rock. So here's the thing. The so it lands. But what happens? The roots don't have anywhere to go. They don't have anywhere to go. The, there's no place, he said, for the moisture, so to speak, to, to sit and for it to gather any, to, to get any nutrients. That's the picture. So the ones on the rock are those who, when they hear the word, receive it with joy. <laughs> That's good stuff, man. Preach, brother. Which is kind of nice, by the way. If you would, every once in a while, I, they should just, just say, just, just participate. Let's be together. Thank you. Thank you. Extra points. Okay? Take something for yourself out of the offering. Okay, no, not really. I'm going to make it cut off your arms. Now, anyway, we, here's the thing. They receive it with joy, right? And, and you want to have joy? I, like I do. I want you to worship with joy. We talked about it last week. I want you to worship with joy. There's a difference between emotion and emotionalism. Emotions ought to be very deeply invested. Emotionalism is a kind of thing that flames up and then flickers out, really goes out really fast. Here, here's, here's what he's getting at. Life's difficulties keep fickle hearts from finding peace. They receive it with joy. Look at the text. But these have no root. They believe for a while and in time of testing, difficulty, trial, tribulation. They go, well, this isn't what I signed up for. Because in the meeting, um, in the car while I was listening to Caleb, when I was watching the preacher on TV, um, when, when I got sent that nifty message that was really inspirational by my friend, that was pretty cool. Pretty cool. When I was growing up, I had the privilege of sitting under some really, some, some really good preachers. I've shared at different times stories about them with you. There are a couple guys that I heard, and I mean, they could say good morning and the hair on the back of my neck would stand up. <gasps> Little kid. <gasps> this guy, they'd roam around with a mic. It was amazing. I heard a guy once in college. I could have listened to that guy for a year. Talk. Serious. He was so just. I, I want to stand up and go. Because I love listening to him. Right. It's easy to get emotional and let emotionalism Receive it with joy. But beware. Because if you don't begin to think deeply about that which is being spoken, you could be guilty of riding a wave to shore only to crash on the rocks of life. Walk out and real life hits you. Difficulty, trial, tribulation, challenge, hardship. You... Receive it with joy. See, here's what happens to some people. Some people really believe 
after, after they've accepted Jesus. A, a lot of people, somewhere down the line is when they really came into the kingdom because they prayed something and it was emotional. They didn't, they, the, but, but they really got down the road and they really like, wow, okay, now I really understand what it is to believe this. That's when they got in it. Here. This wasn't all bad. It was a gateway. But you have other people who receive it in an emotionalism and they get down the road and they go, life's too hard. I'm out. Right? I'm out. They signed up. They signed up for like an all-inclusive resort experience of Christianity and they found out like my wife. Right? They found out like my wife when we went on a mission trip to St. Vincent. And we got off, and the guy said, you're going to stay in it. And she heard the Ritz Hotel, and we pulled up, and it was Rick's Hotel. True story. Rick's, I hate to tell you, was not the Ritz. Okay? <laughs> Sometimes that's what happens. Discipleship is this process that we believe in that's about getting your roots down. This seed sown lands, but life's difficulties on a fickle heart. Don't let it find roots. Stay with me. Third seed, verse 14. And as for what fell among the thorns, they are those who hear, but as they go on their way, they are choked by three things. The cares and riches and pleasures of life and their Fruit does not mature, dies off, never comes to fruition. Life's distractions, that's what this is about, prevent people from producing fruit indicative of the gospel. They get going. And, you know, again, I'm, I, I, I'm no botanist, I'm no horticulturist, but I, I, do, I, I do see plants grow. And I know that thorns, thistles, do not and weeds do not choke out a plant overnight. They grow up with it, and if untended, if not focused on, if not dealt with over time, they end up overtaking it, and it chokes. And you might even not even realize the life is going out of it. So there's three distractions, right? And and we can put them up at cares worries I get you get distracted by worries I get distracted by worries you get distracted by things you're concerned about I get distracted by things I'm concerned about usually they're about expectations I have that end up not being met and therefore I begin to worry about them as though by the force of my will I could change them being met and so I start getting worked up and I get my underwear all in a bunch about stuff that I can't do anything about riches the best text on this right here best text in the New Testament on it. But godliness with contentment is great gain for we brought nothing into the world and we cannot take anything out of the world. But if we have food and clothing with these we'll be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. It's through this craving that some have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. I, my fear in this text is that we read this as like um, people who are whatever economic class we are, they're the next couple up from us. And that's how we read it. We think about it in terms of, well, I'm not rich, it's those people. I'm not like them, I'm not greedy like that. But we're greedy probably in regard to the people behind us down below us, economically speaking, socially speaking. There's this sense in which we don't know how much riches have pervaded us, and they very much have pervaded all of our lives in intense ways, siphoning the life right out of us. Uh, 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 they're, just, they're just killing us. They're just making us think about this and about that and worry about this and about that and quest for this and that, and they're just distractions away from what God would want us to do 
and we're just wringing our hands over whether or not we'll be able to retire the way that we wanted to be able to retire because we can't retire the way that we want to be able to retire. Maybe, in fact, point of fact, our whole life has not been all that we thought it could be. Maybe Jesus didn't want that for you. And maybe it's not what you wanted. It's weird to think about that God enfleshed as a Jewish carpenter may not have had the American dream upon his agenda. May not. Maybe we ought to get ourselves okay with that. Pleasures. Pleasures. Titus 3. For we ourselves were once, this is past tense, this is not what we're supposed to be like now, we were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, and there it is, slaves to various passions and pleasures. Can you be a slave to recreation? Think about that. You think Americans are slaves to recreation? We're working for the weekend. We're real guilty of being slaves to recreation. So much so that even when... I, I, I have found actually in the history of our church, this might be the most difficultly received message at a surface level in, of all the 15 to 16 years of preaching. I always have received the sense that the moment I speak, uh, dealing with any form of our, our enslavement to recreation, that's when people start to check out. I, I just have sensed it palpably. Because we, 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 we really, there's parts of that that we just, that's, come on now. Don't mess with us there. Passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others, hating one another. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, He saved us not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to His own mercy, by the washing of regeneration, renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by His grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. The saying is trustworthy. I want you to insist on these things so that those who have believed in God may be careful to devote themselves to good works. These things are excellent and profitable for people. Please listen. Please hear what I'm going to say. Don't just hear that last part in regard to overt sin and go, yes, we were saved by the grace of God, the pouring out regeneration of the Holy Spirit. Praise God. Isn't it wonderful? Now we get to devote ourselves to good works instead of evil works. No, now you get to devote yourself to good works instead of trivial, mindless pleasures that distract you from the kingdom life. That's what he's saying. But I would rather him say to me that I get to devote myself to good works instead of evil works. That's an easier pill for me to swallow in my present culture than the idea that he would like me to be diligent in kingdom work rather than wasting my life away in nonsense. I'm not saying you don't refresh and rest. Please don't hear that. But that's not the point of this sermon. And I don't know that we really need to hear right now, for most of us, that we really need to have some time that we treasure and cherish for ourselves. We're really struggling with that these days. I don't think that's the case. I think we need to hear that sometimes our calendars The freer we think they are, maybe the more enslaved they are. Maybe the more enslaved they are. A fruitful response to the Word of God takes on a particular disposition. We'll finish these points quickly. Verse 15. As for that in the good soil, they are those who Hearing the word, what do they do? Three things. They have a faithful commitment first. They hold it fast. They take that word and they treasure it. 
Like Job that way, they treasure it more than their daily bread. In an honest and good heart, this is the soil, this is the inner life. They have a faithful commitment, they treasure it, they hold fast to it. They have a virtuous commitment. That is, they've cultivated an honest and a good, it's actually two words that can both be translated good, put coupled together, honest and good, heart, a virtuous commitment. and bear fruit with patience, a perseverant commitment. They're not going to be like the rocky soil that say, oh, buyer's remorse on Jesus, it's too hard, I'm out. They're going to persevere, they're going to be patient, they're going to have that long obedience in the same direction, and keep moving forward. Verse 16, no one after lighting a lamp covers it with a jar or puts it under a bed, but puts it on a stand so that those who enter may see the light. Now, there's two ways that Jesus uses the picture of a light shining in regard to us. Two ways. The first is when he talks in the Sermon on the Mount about being salt and light, and letting your light shine before men. Okay? That's the first way, and that has to do with your testimony, your witness to the truth of the gospel to other people. That's a valid way of talking about it. That is not what he's talking about. He's not sit using it that way here. He's using it oh, the same way he did in Mark 4. Here's how he's using it. Read verse 17. For nothing is hidden that will not be made manifest, nor is anything secret that will not be known and come to light. Here, thinking about the Word of God, what he's concerned about is not the idea of you shining your light, but rather that the Word comes to you and is like a light on you and exposes things in your life in the hidden secret Places and puts them out for you and yes, sometimes for others to see and creates an opportunity that the word is yes, a light to my path and it's like a flashlight on my soul think of Hebrews 4, 12 and 13 the word of God is living and active dynamic Sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and a spirit of joints and marrow. It's a picture of surgery, and it's saying the Word of God is like a metaphysical surgery that happens. It's dynamic, and then it dissects your life. It cuts you open, so to speak, spiritually in God, and you get to see, and the, the good news is you're having surgery. The bad news is He never gives you an anesthetic. and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. It's dynamic, it's dissecting, and then it's discerning. It's going, no, no, wait a minute. What's the real reason you did that? What's the real reason you did that? What's the real reason you didn't do that? And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account, it's disclosing. It's as though the surgeon, God, looks at us and he opens us up and he gets in and he, why is this? Why is this here? What's the motive behind this? And he opens it all up and lays us all out so that he, and so that we, can see what's actually going on and it is in response to us dwelling in if you don't want to be known, stay away from the Word. If you want to see inside your own life and let God do His work, then please listen. It will only happen by the Word. Verse 18. Take care then how you hear. How you hear the Word. For to the one who has, more will be given. From the one who has not, even what he thinks he has will be taken away. What's his point? When you, when, if you hear the word of God right, he's saying, guess what waits for you? More blessing. More insight. More transformation. 
it rolls on itself if you'll open yourself to hear, really hear, the Word. It avails us even more growth and blessing. And then finally, number seven. Then his brothers, his mother and his brothers came to him, but they could not reach him because of the crowd. He was told, your mother and your brothers are standing outside desiring to see you. But he answered them. He, he takes it as a teaching moment because he's a rabbi. My mother and my brothers are those who hear the word of God and do it. Hunkers down on this idea. It's his way of saying that um, there is a bloodline, the bloodline of the kingdom trumps, outdoes, outruns the bloodline of life. There's a bloodline that makes its way from the cross. Hebrews 2.11 For he who sanctifies Jesus and those who are sanctified us all have one source and that is why he's not ashamed to call them brothers. You're a part of the family of God. Part of the family of God. If you're willing to be sanctified by the Word of God and the work of God in Christ. If I, if you, if I am willing, uh, one of the things I learn in the Bible, if I'm willing to go it alone with Jesus, I will never actually be alone. But if I'm unwilling to go alone with Jesus, then I'm never actually going anywhere. So, respond to the Word. Engage the Word. Open yourself to the Word. Sit over the Word. Sit saturating in the Word. And, and, and spend time. Spend time with a verse. And just turn it over. Write out how it can apply to your life. Think of a hundred ways the thing will just move and shake in your life. And apply it. Apply it. That's what, that's what it means to be a student of the Word. It doesn't mean that you're able to be really good at Bible bingo. It doesn't. It means that this thing and the Christ revealed in this is all over your heart. Father, I pray that you would get all over our hearts, all in our minds, all up in our stuff, so that the roots could go deep, so that they could branch out wide, so that we could have eyes to see, ears to hear, hearts to receive your word. Do that work in us, we pray in Jesus' name. stand and sing together.
Where sin runs deep, your grace is more. Where grace is found is where you are. And where you are, Lord, I am free. Holiness is Christ in me. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. My one defense, my righteousness. Oh, God, how I need you. Lord, I need strength, my song, this cornerstone, this solid crown, firm through the fiercest drought in storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are stilled, when striving cease. My comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. of God in helpless play this gift of love and righteousness scorned by the ones he came to save till on that cross as Jesus died the wrath of God was satisfied for every sin on him was laid here in the death of Christ I live there in 
the ground his body lay light of the world by darkness slain then bursting forth in glorious day up from the grave he rose again and as he stands in victory since curse has lost its grip on me for i am his and he is mine bought with the precious blood of Christ no guilt in life no fear in death this is the power of Christ in me from life's first cry to final breath Jesus commands my destiny no power of hell no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns or calls me home here in the power of Christ, I'll stand. All right, this next song I think is a little bit of a new one for us here. Um, I don't think we've done it a whole lot, so. Uh, this one's a great are you lord um and i wanted to read the scripture with it um this is uh, psalm 19 14 it says let the words of my house mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight O lord my rock and my redeemer and so um as we sing these lyrics um it talks about how god gives us life and he restores us um as we think about those things, let's just sing how great he is um, together. It's your breath in our lungs, 
So we pour out our praise, we pour out our praise, it's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise to you only, it's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise, we pour out our praise, it's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise to you only. And all the earth will shout your praise our hearts will cry these bones will sing great are you lord and all the earth will shout your praise our hearts will cry these bones will sing great are you shout your praise our hearts will cry these bones will sing great are you lord it's your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise we pour out our praise it's your breath in our so we pour out our praise to you only. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise. We pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise to you only. As we think on responding to the word, um, I wanted to send you away with this verse. This is Colossians 3, 16 through 17. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Thanks, guys. You have a great week.